finally figured out how to make longer videos on Instagram. So I thought, what an opportunity just to make a uh, table talk, I guess, of sorts of uh, some old guns that I like and would like to share with you now that I can film stuff over a minute. So what, what I have brought today is a true oddball of the Civil War that I want to talk about and I'm sure you guys will enjoy too. And that is the Lamatt Revolver. Now, as you can see right off the bat, it's very pretty, very excellent craftsmanship, and it is just really neat. This was made by Navy Arms Company uh, in Ridgefield, New Jersey, I believe that's correct. Uh, they are actually no longer in business. I think they've been out of business the last 20 years, but uh, they still manufacture these. I believe it's uh, either Pieta or Uberti or both that still produce these. Uh, so... I just wanted to talk about this today because I thought it was really cool and it's one of my favorite guns that I own. So, a little bit of history first. Uh, at this time, and this would have been the time of the Civil War. So, like I said, it was the oddball of the Civil War. Something like this, you wouldn't have seen in the North. Believe it or not, it would have been in the Confederacy. The Confederate States of America, they actually were the ones that had this. So this particular gun was developed in France. I don't know the entire history, like the prototype or anything like that, but I know this was produced or, or made in uh, France at the time. So it was a Colonel Lamat, I believe was the guy that designed it. Could be wrong about that, don't quote me on that. Uh, but there was a design with this and it was very interesting. Its nickname was also called the Grape Shot Revolver. Well, what do you mean by the Grape Shot Revolver? Well, in comparison to what I have here, which is the 1860 Colt Army, this one is also made by, let's see real quick, I believe you birdie. So this was also something used in the Civil War on both sides. Uh, this is a six shot cap and ball revolver. This was designed where you had to put it to half cock, you had to load all your chambers with black powder, typically a ball or conical bullet were used sometimes, and put a percussion cap on each end. It is a single action, which means you have to cock it all the way back to shoot it. So for those times, six shots wasn't uncommon. So actually revolvers have been around for about 20 years about this time. But this would have been your Glock basically at the time. So six shots, that's a lot in comparison to old guns where you had to load for the muzzle and you only had one shot. So this kind of changed things. It was incredible, six shots. Well, this Lamat, those of you might not know, is a nine shot revolver. Now some of you are going, whoa, nine shots? Yeah, it is. And another cool thing about it is, the bottom here is a shotgun barrel. Yes, a 20 gauge shotgun barrel, about a five inch barrel. Yeah, that's insane. So in comparison to his counterpart, the 1860 Army, which are the same caliber, 44, you had nine shots plus a shotgun barrel. So for those times, if you had said, hey, I've got a nine shot revolver that also has a shotgun barrel, you'd get laughed at. They go, no way. So same deal, you have to put it half cocked so the cylinder spins up. You have to load each chamber with your powder, your ball. This was not designed to shoot any conical bullets. So it would have been ball. And like I said, you had a shotgun barrel. So if you look closely in the back, you've got all your nipples for your percussion caps, but also you've got a little lever here on the hammer. If you just place that down, now that activates where you can shoot the shotgun barrel. That's what this nipple in the back does. So if you were really in a pickle, you had that option. So you had 10 shots total, nine pistol shots and a shotgun barrel. So pretty insane. You wouldn't have seen this a whole lot very rare. Like I said, they make the reproductions, but they were actually very rare at the time. So France basically had designed this, uh, Colonel Lamatt, and they, were, they weren't very popular in France. Well, the Civil War was going on at the time. So they're like, well, why not we just sell the Confederacy? I don't think, I think they tried with the Union. I don't think they liked them. So they're like, well, Confederacy will take anything they get. Let's try them. I don't remember how the numbers of how many they bought, but it was a novelty gun. It was a uh, cavalry man's gun that was really high up in rank 
or a uh, basically a general's gun. Something that really wasn't used. It was a novelty item, something you were given as a gift. But it was neat. It was insane. You'd never seen anything like this. So, in comparison to the 1860 Army, same thing. Single action, have to cock it every time, every time you shoot it. So, at that time, the cap and ball revolver, this was before cartridges. So, to load a six-shot cap and ball revolver, you typically took, if you were good at it, when you're using loose powder, ball caps, take about maybe five minutes. If you hurried and trained, maybe four minutes. It took a while. But you had six shots. The Lamad, on the other hand, you have nine shots plus a shotgun barrel. I have shot this one personally. It's a lot of fun. But that is the drawback. It takes to reload everything about 12 minutes. So it's fun when it's fully loaded. But when it's not loaded anymore, it sucks to have to reload. So that was the major drawback of the Lamat. But at the time, you know... Nine shots, whoa, that's a lot. But like I said, this would have been a higher-ups weapon. So they would have typically had it holstered. They would have been in the back, conducting the battle, not on the battlefield, so it would have never been used. In fact, I don't think there's any records that they, these were used or a certain colonel or whatever had his and fired upon someone, killed him. It's not recorded or that any that were picked up off the battlefield. So they weren't as practical and they were rare. So if you saw them and you told somebody, hey, I've got a nine shot revolver with a shotgun barrel, you'd probably get laughed at. Uh, so one of the, that was just one of the few drawbacks. They were rare, took a long time to reload and they weren't widely used. What's the differences? Well, if you look, the 1860 Army, just like most cap and ball revolvers, the loading lever is on the bottom. That's how you load the gun. Well, when they were designing the Lamat, they, they couldn't do that because Colt had a patent and they were afraid if they had done that, Colt would have sued him and that would have been the end of that. So what this one has, it, let me see if I can, yeah, here we go. It goes backwards and that's how you load each of the chambers. Also, it doubles as your ramrod for the shotgun barrel. So it does both of them. So kind of neat, different, but he had to do that. They had to do that so they didn't get sued by Colt. What was one of the problems? Well, this loading lever was incredibly weak. It's recorded that most of them broke off. It was not common to find them with, uh, it was common to find them without their ramrods because they were so, or uh, loading levers because they were so weak. They'd break off or they would lose their uh, shotgun ramrod and then now you're out of business. If you're back then, your, your loading lever broke, there was no replacing it. There was no fixing it. Most gunsmiths are, didn't know how to fix something like that and only parts they had would have been Colt or other companies. So they wouldn't have had this. So you were out of business pretty quick with reloading it and it was basically useless at that point. So that was one major issue. And it even happens with the reproductions today, believe it or not, they've been known to break off. Some guys just take them off, they'll load it up, then take it off for shooting. And they would flap around typically between each shot. It would fall up and just, it wasn't practical. So that was one major problem. Number two, uh, it is a threaded barrel. I would show you, but it is very hard to put this gun back together. So the barrel is threaded. You have to spin it off to disassemble it versus the 1860. You just pull a wedge out, comes off. This didn't. So the threads are exactly right to get it perfectly in line with your cylinder. Problem was, if you didn't get it perfectly in line, your cylinder would not match up with the barrel. So what would happen is when you're shooting this, part of your ball is getting shaved off by the barrel and you're losing tremendous accuracy and could possibly damage the gun further to where it didn't work. Well, that's no good. So that was another drawback is you had to make sure that your barrel was completely lined up with your cylinder and you still have to do that with the reproductions today. Unfortunately, I have to do this every time I shoot it. I will double check before I start loading it to make sure the barrel is in line. So that was one of the drawbacks. And because of its design like that, if that happened, you would get... Uh, you could damage the cylinder. Also, you could get the cylinder got fouled up very easily because of that versus this one because it wasn't combed. The back of the barrel wasn't combed. 
So typically it would get fouled up relatively quickly and it was inoperable at that point. But honestly, it's just a fun shooter. It is a novelty item, something you don't see anymore. Like I said, this is one by Navy Arms Co. They're out of business. They still manufacture these, but they stopped making these. So that's pretty cool about it. Uh, they're fun to shoot. They're target shooters. They're, they're a lot of fun. Another thing I'm gonna talk about, shooting it. So, like I said, loading it already takes a long time, long time. So, uh, problems with that, because, you know, like I said, reloading for a long time. So, loading it. The 1860 Army, I typically, for target shooting, is use 30 grains of either Go-X, uh, Swish, or Shootsin black powder, or Pyrodex. I like to use Pyrodex because it's cheaper, more available, and I'm not using my expensive powder. 30 grains is all you need for target shooting or if you're gonna go hunting with it, it's plenty. It will load all the way up to 40. I don't recommend that for long use because you will end up blowing the wedge out and have to replace the barrel. So I don't recommend that, but you could do that. The problem with the Lamat was if you're gonna load this with a patch and a ball, the most you can get down it is about 25 grains of powder. Well, with that, it doesn't have a whole lot of recoil, which is good for accuracy, but it's such a big caliber, it's not very strong. It doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Uh, velocity is slower compared to the 1860 Army. So it's not all there. Now, if you don't use a patch, you can load 30 grains with just bare ball, but then you have to lubricate every chamber. That gets messy unless some guys, I know there's some of you out there that prefer to do that. I don't, gets really messy, hard to clean up, don't like doing that. So you would have to do that to lubricate between shots. That's what the wadding does. So if you wanted a little bit more power, kind of like the 1860 Army, you could do it that way, but now your loading sequence is even longer to reload it. So that's one way of doing it. I have actually taken this out one time when I had it on me, went on a feral hog hunt, we wounded a pig, went up to go shoot it. It just pissed it off. It 25 grains was not enough. Unless it is like a precision shot, like not to be gross, but through the eye, through the ear, it won't kill it. It'll just piss it off. But 30 grains, on the other hand, with the 1860 Army, I have actually dropped feral hogs with one shot before, believe it or not, it will do it. So I would have to try it again with 30 grains if I ever got the opportunity to see what it would do. Definitely let y'all know, but I'm not for sure. But as for target shooting, it is actually pretty good and it throws a pretty well group. Last time I shot it, I uh, was standing probably 12 yards and I put all nine shots in about, I'd say about four by four square or circle, and that's pretty good. It shoots a little high, but not bad, because there's low recoil. So it's very accurate when you do everything right. That's just the thing. You gotta make sure you've done everything right for this thing to make it work. As for the shotgun barrel, it is cool and neat to have that option, just because, you know, you get close enough with somebody and you shoot this, that's gonna be a wad of smoke and you're gonna get hit everywhere practicality. I uh, don't recommend shooting a round ball out of the shotgun barrel because that's a lot of pressure in the heart of the gun. Don't recommend doing that. It's typically made for birdshot or buckshot. In a pickle, they're three feet away. Yeah, that buckshot's probably going to do a lot of damage and it would kill somebody easily. Birdshot would e at least get them off you if it didn't kill, if it didn't kill them. So that was cool. Problem was, if you didn't load that shotgun barrel right and you're riding on your horse with your holster, the shot and powder was known to roll out or fall out. Now you don't have a, now you got to reload or you don't have a shot. So that didn't work out very well. I'm sure you could have made paper cartridges. Maybe there was a guy that did and it worked. I don't know any history about that, nor have I heard any. So that was another problem. Uh, so yeah, shotgun barrel didn't work very much. Plus, after about five yards, maybe 10, the shotgun barrel's useless. You're lucky to hit him anywhere, really, because the head is ridiculous. 
but that's kind of what they were going for. So unless he's in five yards of you, it's useless. It's not going to do a whole lot. You might pass that, hit him with a pellet or two, but it's probably not going to kill him. So it was cool. I liked the idea. I saw where they were going. That's awesome. That's unheard of. Really cool. So for me personally, I don't love the shotgun barrel because I don't want to risk it falling out in a holster, the shot or anything like that. I just love the chamber. I just like shooting it as a revolver. That's cool. But if you ever find yourself one of these, you do have that option of the shotgun too. Also, if you disassemble this gun, take the barrel off, take the cylinder off, you still have a functional gun. The barrel is still connected to the rest of the grip. You could load it up and shoot it just like that without the rest of the parts. So you still have an active gun. So that's kind of cool too. Yeah, I mean, you can't do that with any of these. You take them apart, they're done. They can't work. So it was very neat. But as far as history goes, they were rare. You didn't see them. A lot of people probably never heard of them. They were just different. They were different. But if you ever find yourself one of these, I recommend picking them up. Now, the problem is with these reproductions, you can get a Colt, well, Colt 1860 Army that's based off a of Colt. It, they run for about 350 maybe maybe 450 depending on who you buy from or where at a vendor or a gun store it depends so not bad not bad and they're very reliable very well-made guns the lamat on the other hand right now brand new if you can find one they're going for about fourteen hundred dollars yeah for a cap and ball revolver wicked expensive i was fortunate enough to find this one at a gun show for a fraction of that so i was very lucky but yeah, 1400 unless you just love this stuff, which I do, maybe later down the road, I'd buy another one, maybe. But if you're just getting into the cap and ball game, just get yourself one of these. Don't, you're not gonna find these anyway, and you're gonna spend literally four times as much for the Lamat versus the 1860 Army. So that's just something to look for. And that's basically it, guys. I just wanted to talk a video. I just thought it would be a cool first video to talk about some old guns, and I plan to do this more in the future. I thought it was fun. I brought the 1860 Army out as a comparison to show you two that were used in the Civil War, and there was others as well. So there you go. And these would have been used, preferably the 1860 Army, up until 1880s, 1890s, believe it or not. This, probably not. Probably didn't, because it was incredibly rare. So after the war, they probably just put them in a drawer and that's where they sat. But uh, anyway, thanks guys. Thanks for joining me. I had a lot of fun doing this. I've been wanting to do this for the longest time. If you have any questions, you want to know more, I'll try to find out. Leave comments down below. Please let me know if you want to know how it shoots, what type of powder I use, whatever, for any of these guns. Again, leave a comment down below. If you like this and you don't subscribe to me on Instagram, subscribe. This is all I do. It's a lot of fun, mostly political political stuff on my story and guns. That's what I like. It's like, but anyway, guys, thanks for joining me and we'll catch y'all in the next video. And remember, keep your powder dry and I'm the musket man. Thanks guys. We'll catch you later.